can you lose your job for free thought? Will you have your speech policed at every angle, every aspect, every walk of society. Hansel culture is real, it's insane, and it's growing exponentially, and it's coming to a neighborhood near you. Where does this cancel culture lead us? You see the final expression of cancel culture in Islamist terrorist groups like uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. See, cancel culture is like COVID-19, because if it could happen to Dr. Seuss, it might happen to you. I'm bored of the seat. Ow. I'm bored of the free speech debate. Ow. I'm bored of the free speech debate. It always seems to me this sort of mad shouting match between free speech absolutism on the one hand and justifying censorship on the other in a sort of abstracted philosophical debate between competing rights. Instead today I want to talk about the material realities of free speech. How material economic and political conditions are what dictates the bounds of speech and how the debate itself is used to perpetuate racialization, othering and the maintenance of a dominant liberal capitalist interest. Shit, man, pulling that tape off my mouth hurt. Jesus. Do not recommend. Do not recommend that. Part 1. The Media and Propaganda When we talk about free speech, what free speech really means and what its purpose is, I think it's important not to reduce it to an individualised, rights-based level. Having the right to say something without being persecuted is valuable, but limited aspect of what free speech should be really said to mean. Instead, we should look beyond individual expression and see how particular kinds of speech are suppressed and delegitimized by the capitalist system under which we live. And one of the primary means of doing this is through the media. In Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman lay out convincingly and in excruciating detail how far from being a model of free speech which holds dominant power to account, Western media functions more as a tool of propaganda for capital and imperial interests. While Western media might not be as overtly servile as some of the media in more authoritarian states, although <clears throat> sometimes I do wonder. Um, this is the Chancellor imagined as Superman flying and then we can also see the Chancellor imagined as Superman helping old ladies. Um, so that was both created by the BBC. Someone who is very bright and very smart. Oxford and Stanford educated smoothie, really. He immediately struck me as somebody that was going places. <clears throat> Though it is willing to subject government and corporations to, in some cases, quite hostile criticism, the nature and extent of such criticisms rarely if ever, challenge the foundational structures of capitalism and often just work to reinforce those same structures. Chomsky and Herman established a set of filters which push Western media into a particular form which is at least acceptable but frequently just desirable to capital interests. And worse, they operate in such an insidious way that people in the media often don't realise that they're part of a propaganda model and in fact they think that they're producing pure, objective, fact-based analysis. Oxford and Stanford educated smoothie, really. And their model actually makes a lot of intuitive sense if you think about it for, I don't know, literally a second. If ownership of the media is concentrated in the hands of a few billionaire owners, then... Well, that's something. If ownership of the media is concentrated in the hands of a few billionaires with particular class interests, then of course the media that such companies produce will be naturally constrained by those interests. If you require ad money to run, then of course you're not going to run stories critical of particular companies, or even critical of the general interests of the business community. Just look at this horribly cringe-inducing clip from Jimmy Fallon, a man who was probably built in an Amazon factory somewhere. Alexa. How bad are Amazon working conditions? <laughs> Alexa, stop. Sure. Alexa, stop. Here we go. 
All right, no, I have no, to. Alexa. I... No, Alexa. Alexa, no, what is no, you? No, no, Alexa. Busted? This is me time now. <laughs> Alexa, stop. Yeah, oh, stop, please. Alexa, please listen to me. That guy's more of a robot than Alexa is. He was built to get ad revenue for these companies. All these factors naturally constrain speech, which don't fit within such constraints. I mean, in that clip, the unionization and the awful con working conditions of Amazon were just completely d driven away from at top speed for fear of losing ad revenue. And that's the thing about propaganda. To lift up some narratives, you naturally have to suppress others. Marcuse de detailed this well, so I'm just gonna uh, <laughs> lazily steal from him and pass it off as my own intellectualism. See, I, a smart person said it, so it must be right. In the United States, this tendency goes hand in hand with the monopolistic concentration of capital in the formation of public opinion, i.e. of the majority. The chance of influencing in any effective way this majority is at a price, in dollars, totally out of reach of the radical opposition. Here too, free competition and exchange of ideas have become a farce. The left has no equal voice, no equal access to the mass media and their public facilities. Not because a conspiracy excludes it, but because, in good old capitalist fashion, it does not have the required purchasing power. And the left does not have the purchasing power because it is the left. In essence, historically, the tendency of capital to concentrate in fewer and fewer monopolistic entities has squeezed the ability of the left to maintain any media institutions. Where left media has existed, the costs of production have either forced it into advertising, and with that constrained its ability to make radical critiques, or forced it into selling to corporate entities, basically crushing any radical potential, or simply going out of business. Speech which isn't conducive to capital interests is systematically suppressed, while speech which supports capital is systematically elevated. And this all happens without the need for overt state attacks on free speech. We can also point to close connections between government and the media which further influence this propaganda model. Take, for example, the BBC, where the editor for their Sunday flagship political news programme was this bizarre, angry-looking Eggman, who is the brother of a Conservative MP, and who upon leaving this role went straight into being Prime Minister Theresa May's head of communications, where he had a reputation for being particularly right-wing. Whereas the current Director General of the BBC is, amazingly, a former Conservative Council candidate. I mean, like, ever being uppity and technical about it, we could call this regulatory capture. Or, we could just call it corrupt as fuck. Then there's the consistent problem of employees of right-wing think tanks with shady funding streams being consistently invited on news shows to give their expert opinion on issues and never having their uh, interests or funding questioned. Contrastingly, when left-wing sources are ever allowed on the news, they're consistently delegitimized as partisan, while right-wing sources are consistently just presented neutrally. And this is related to the fact that, as noted in Manufacturing Consent, News workers are predisposed to treat bureaucratic accounts as factual because news personnel participate in upholding a normative order of authorised knowers in the society. Reporters operate with the attitude that officials ought to know what it is their job to know. In particular, a news worker will recognise an official's claim to knowledge not merely as a claim, but as a credible, competent piece of knowledge. This means that particular sources are systematically privileged. Particular speech is systematically privileged. Government sources, corporate sources, and think tank sources, which may have shady funding and interests, all of whom share essentially the same class interests, are elevated above anyone who has far less power within society. And just, just an aside to maintain my brand, these think tank sources with shady corporate interests and funding were instrumental in the social movement from above which imposed neoliberalism on us. The, the, these things have real material effects, obviously. All these things build up to produce a propaganda model which systematically elevates right-wing or centrist speech over the speech of anything which is radical or left-leaning at all. 
And I want to be clear, this isn't a party political issue. When the Labour Party or the Democratic Party represents dominant capital interests, then the media will gladly line up behind them as well. I mean, the Democrats have got plenty of corporate media support because they don't challenge anything fundamental about society. And in the case of Labour, just look at noted illegal warmonger Tony Blair selling his soul to emissary of Satan Rupert Murdoch to get elected. Rather than a partisan issue, it's really an issue of the political and media system itself, where in order to get into a high position or in either institution, you either have to be from a particular class background or you have to embody a, a commitment to these particular ideological interests, which are within the bounds of what's deemed acceptable. How can you how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know don't say that you're self-censoring? I'm sure you believe everything you're saying, but what I'm saying is, if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. And on top of all of this, since we live in a system where these political and media structures are dominant, where only those with particular material or class interests or an ideological commitment to capitalism, to imperialism, to whiteness, to patriarchy are accepted, then the spectre of communism and subversive ideology will always be pitched as the great looming evil. To steal from Marcuse again, Surely no government can be expected to foster its own subversion. But it's more than no government. No capitalist system can be expected to tolerate its own subversion. Communism must be the great evil, because it is the subversion of capitalism. Similarly, I think we're seeing the emergence of critical race theory or wokeness emerging as the new bugbear of the right. Just look at eminent weirdo dipshit and sword guy James Lindsay, or any of his just nonsense spewings on Twitter. And, and the reason that this uh, critical race theory has become uh, a, a particular bugbear is because it's been used to generate specific material revolts against the dominant capitalist system and against the racial state. Suddenly it's a threat, it's a subversion, and so it can't be tolerated. And this is an essential part of the charade of liberal democratic free speech. As long as left-wing speech remains relatively powerless, then it will be tolerated to a small degree within these media systems for the sake of their own legitimacy. There will be a few token leftists in positions in newspapers or invited on TV for academic discussions, but the moment that a left-wing movement begins to gain any momentum at all, the entire media system will clamp down against it because it's a threat. Just take, for example, Jeremy Corbyn whose movement of social democratic reforms represented a tangible threat to neoliberal hegemony. Because he was a threat, the media immediately coalesced to ensure that he and his movement were immediately demonised and ostracised from the political landscape of the country. These stories often invoked the fear of the dreaded communist threat, with stories like Corbyn is a Czech spy, or, or putting pictures of him on the news with, with, with like a Russian hat and a big like Russian style flag behind him. And they made sure to paint his relatively anti-imperialist politics in the most damning light possible, accusing him of being a terrorist sympathiser and a threat to British national security. And we're seeing this again right now in England, as police have been repeatedly attacking peaceful protesters with cavalry and attack dogs. Protests which have been against, among other things, uh, new legislation which would give police huge amounts of discretionary power to clamp down on protests, to clamp down on freedom of expression. But because the police are an essential institution for the maintenance of capitalism, this violence which they caused is being framed as coming from far left agitators within the protesters, where the police are just there trying to maintain law and order. The police need to be protected, while protests against them need to be delegitimized. So the speech of police forces, of spooky experts and of right-wing pundits is elevated far above the speech of any of the protesters that the police were attacking. All of this is to say that corporate media structures in liberal democracies work as propaganda, not for a particular government, but for capitalism and for the state. This elevates speech which supports such structures, but suppresses speech which is critical of it, tolerating it only so long as it poses no real threat. But the current battleground of free speech is today framed not as being so much within traditional media, 
but in the domain of woke scolds, cancelled culture and snowflakes like me on social media. I mean, <laughs> I, I guess I am pale enough to be a snowflake. And I am a special individual, I will say that. Part 2. Free speech and social media. Yeah, I'm just keeping the same title cards every time because this image of Mark's just... It makes me laugh. It looks like he's had his comedy special lifted off Netflix for saying a slur. I moved to my desk to break up the visuals. They even brought Mark's along. This has no philosophical meaning. I'm not capable of that. This isn't philosophy, Chip. When the internet and social media platforms first emerged, they were heralded as this new frontier of free speech. They were totally unregulated, free from censorship and moderation. The Wild West, baby. Since then, as bits and pieces of community moderation and censorship have encroached upon online spaces, the general arguments have again failed, in my view, to really tackle the core issues which define free speech. These arguments always fall into the same pattern when some, like, Nazi or arsehole gets yeeted off the site. You get some tedious wanker talking about, like, Oh, we need to protect free speech at all costs. This is infringement on civil liberties. This is cancel culture, woke scolds, Twitter mobs, snowflakes. <laughs> all of which miss the central point that the reason that free speech is a problem online is because these platforms are just companies. They're just companies. It's capitalism again. And as such, these companies simply reproduce the same issues which inhibit free speech offline, online. Social media companies are subject to many of the same constraints as exist within Chomsky and Herman's propaganda model. They're owned by large companies, those large companies are based in the West, and are filled with people who come from particular backgrounds and hold particular liberal capitalist ideologies. Much like traditional media, because these companies have interests that are in line with the liberal capitalist state, then there is inevitably a massive amount of cross-pollination between government and these companies. I don't much like the word cross-pollination there, especially because I'm just about to talk about Nick Clegg. Take for example the fact that former Deputy Prime Minister at National Villain and Perpetual Sad Boy Nick Clegg went almost straight from politics into becoming the, the, the what is it, the, the, the Vice President of Global Affairs and Communications at Facebook. I had to look that up, I had to, I had to read that because it's a job title that's so boring it immediately deletes itself from my brain. But in this role, uh, Clegg reinforced Facebook's policy that uh, any speech from politicians is inherently newsworthy and should always be seen and heard. As in the propaganda model, this elevates the speech of a political class who uphold and project particular ideological positions above the speech of activists on the ground, particularly anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist activists. And Nick Clegg isn't just a one-off. As York puts it, there's a revolving door between social media companies, government, law enforcement, and uh, other corporations, which creates a very elite subset of people from particular backgrounds with particular class interests and particular ideologies who are in charge of making and enacting the rules of social media with no oversight, almost no oversight at all. And this can manifest itself in deeply destructive ways which reinforce Western imperial interests. Take the case of Palestine, where social media activism is an essential tool of bringing together a dispersed diaspora of people to combat the mainstream narrative of Israel and Palestine as is projected through mainstream Western media. Just as Palestinian activist voices have been historically devalued and silenced by mainstream media, so too have they been censored by social media platforms, while Israeli hate speech on the same platforms often goes ignored. This goes hand in hand with Facebook's Tel Aviv office, which has jurisdiction over Palestinian land as well, announcing a formal collaboration between Facebook and the Israeli government with the stated purpose of tackling extremism. As such, Facebook was replicating online the very same structures of Palestinian occupation as exist offline. And in the wake of this collaboration, documents leaked to the Guardian newspaper revealed how Facebook's moderation policies were discriminatory towards Palestinians and Palestinian liberation organisations. 
Facebook's role as a Western corporation, with close ties to Western governments and their allies like Israel, allow it to moderate the speech of any group it considers to be a threat, whether that's terrorist groups or groups fighting for their own liberation. And, and what's being cancelled, except fighting for your liberation and having your speech systematically oppressed by unaccountable Western corporations with close ties to oppressive states? Hashtag cancelled. Free speech on these platforms is impossible. It just is. It will never exist. The only way that there could ever be a close approximation to free speech is by tackling these fundamental underlying societal structures of capitalism, of imperialism, and of racialization. And to get even more sinister for a second, I guess that's why you're here. These systems which moderate speech also establish huge frameworks of mass surveillance on behalf of corporations and the state. Which I, I'm sure we're all aware of. Like, on and out, we, we know that we're being watched, right? Like, like nobody's under any illusions. Like Foucault... Foucault? Like Foucault's Panopticon. We self-regulate and moderate our speech online because we know that governments or corporations or even just other snitching people are willing to keep tabs on what we post. Obviously this risk is far, far more acute in cases like Palestinian activism or for already over-policed minority groups. Social media companies will never be able to provide true free speech because they are companies owned and controlled by a few individuals with rules we don't have any power to control or even provide any oversight of. And they have one overarching motive, and that's profit. Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, said as much, which is really useful to me because he's just saying the shit I'm accusing him of. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. This profit motive can occasionally drive these companies to make decisions which are okay, like the banning of Nazis on social media platform to make it more pleasant to be there if you're not a Nazi. Most, most people who aren't Nazis don't much like hanging around with Nazis. Which, to be clear, is a very good and very funny thing to happen any time a Nazi is banned on Twitter as, a, as an angel gets its wings. But this motive also allows profitable right-wingers like like the world's largest and angriest shithead toddler here, a free platform to spout off his racism and transphobia constantly without fear of being censored because he makes them the money. And he makes them the money so they're not going to get rid of him, despite the fact that he's just terrible in every way. Is he, does he really think he's funny? Does anyone? Okay, well, just now while I've been editing, it's come out that Crowder's finally done enough to get YouTube to uh, suspend his account for a week. So, uh, after after several years of being totally racist and, and just awful in every way, YouTube's response is to suspend him for a week. Um, which I suppose is better than nothing, but uh, to anyone who's going to come at me in the comments, I know what you're going to say, and it doesn't invalidate my point. I'm still right. I'm still right. This isn't about some abstract, free speech absolutist fighting for everyone's right to post. Free, fighting for free speech online doesn't mean fighting for the right of Nazis to post. Don't do that. Don't be a rube. Be cool. Like me. Fighting for free speech online means the exact same thing as fighting for free speech offline. That is, freedom of speech can only be realistically said to exist once we overthrow the systems of domination that exist within our society. So it's those systems that we should be targeting, not concerning ourselves with any individual's right to post. Part three, racialization, or what the free speech debate is really for. This bit's uh, the most interesting bit, by the way, so please don't switch off. I like this bit, I like this section, it's a good section. Here I am back in the chair. What a, what a wild ride this video is. I want to now take a step in a, in a slightly different direction and talk about how the free speech debate itself is deeply imbued with reactionary elements which make it more than just a dog whistle for the far right, but a fundamental building block of the trash ideology of liberalism itself. The free speech debate is more than just about free speech, it's about constructing a liberal ideal against which an other 
can be constructed. So when I was first researching this topic, I, got, I was quite frustrated because so much of what is written carries with it certain liberal assumptions that few people seem willing to interrogate. This goes way back to some of the foundational thinkers of liberalism, like, you know, everyone's favourite shithead, John Stuart Mill. John Shithead Mill, more like. While liberalism presented itself as a system of tolerance, piss boys like Mill were quick to place racialized limitations of who gets to benefit from this toleration. Mill argues that such toleration should only apply to human being in the maturity of their faculties, and that liberty as a principle has no application to any state of things anterior to the time when mankind had become capable of being improved by free and equal discussion. And how, how convenient for Mill that it's people like him who can benefit from liberty. S so convenient. What Mill and liberalism in general is doing here is invoking the idealised values of European, uh, coded as white, society. Idealised values of freedom, of toleration, of liberty, and the rest of that twee bullshit are invoked while simultaneously constructing a racialised, less civilised other in the colonial subject. Such subjects were seen as less human than the Europeans, and as such they were not capable of enjoying things like free speech and toleration. This dehumanisation was essential for liberalism to maintain its justification for European imperialism and colonialism. And it remains essential today as a way in which whiteness is continually reconstructed to retain its dominant value within racial capitalism. And this is particularly visible today when we look at the ways that this idealised Western liberal value of free speech is often positioned against a growing uh, mythical, anti-Western, anti-liberal, anti-free speech threat of Islam. As Kest Kinnan argues, The search for core values and the establishment of nationalised liberal identities evoke and re-articulate post-colonial imaginaries of Europe as the cradle of civilization and humanity, seen to enhance superior moral, cultural, and political legacies. I think this dynamic also applies when Black Lives Matter protests and knocks down statues of famous racists. The protests and protesters are othered and racialized as being less human, less civilized, less able to enjoy the, the liberal ideal of free speech. You look up and you see a group of demonstrators walking down the street yelling and holding flags that say Black Lives Matter. But then suddenly the mob is there, at your table, screaming in your face, throwing chairs, smashing glasses, sweeping cutlery to the floor, threatening to kill you. Within seconds, you're running for your life. And as such, the expression of their speech, which is subversive and dangerous to the current system, is deemed legitimate to suppress. Just look at this <laughs> unhinged post. And I think this is the real core issue, which is at the heart of the re-emergence of the free speech debate now. The most tedious dickheads in the world, like Olympic gold medalist and pants shitting Caitlin Bennett, or anthropomorphised thwomp from Super Mario Charlie Kirk, or uh, Sid the Sloth from uh, Ice Age Lawrence Fox will trot out these classics about <laughs> banning free speech on campus by protesting some racist giving a talk there. And in doing so, they are supporting, they're reinforcing particular classic liberal assumptions and foundational values about who has the right to free speech and who doesn't, about who is more human, who is more civilised, and who isn't. And this isn't just confined to like a coterie of twisted up right wing ghouls, it has real material impacts on government policy. In the UK, there are plans to establish new laws to protect free speech on campus in the face of growing cancel culture. Oh, fuck. They got... How is our government so lame? Did Marx predict that we'd be ruled by dorks? Did you predict that? That we'd be ruled by dorks? Did you? You probably did. This new legislation is being brought in despite the fact that 
uh, a study of 10,000 speaker events which uh, which was due to take place at universities in 2019 and 2020 Gu guess how many guess how many were were, were cancelled I'll, I'll give you six seconds to guess starting now it was six uh, 10,000 six were cancelled cancel culture on, on campus got six events and and of those events, they were mostly cancelled through uh, admin error. Admin error is the real enemy of free speech. And one of them was Jeremy Corbyn. So, really, that where, where were the free speech brigade then? The government is invoking free speech, not out of any genuine concern about suppression on campus, but because they want to further an ideological project of who should be allowed to speak and who shouldn't be. This is particularly clear when you consider another report which found that one of the main sources of suppression of free speech on UK campuses was the government's own anti-extremism programme PREVENT. This programme requires universities to vet potential speakers for any extremist views that they might hold. A programme which is absolutely dripping in Islamophobic connotations. This is evidenced by the fact that many Muslim students at British universities have reported self-censoring because of the fear generated by the PREVENT programme. The phantom of Foucault is again present here. Muslim students engage in self-regulation, suppressing their own speech because of a fear which is created by PREVENT that they're being surveilled by society. But curiously, the free speech warriors are not up in arms about this real, genuine threat to free speech on university campuses. Instead, they rail against this myth, this fucking ghost in their head of left-wing extremists or Muslim extremists who are threatening their free speech on campus, who are a threat to them. And this is no different from what John Stuart Mill was saying back in the day. Muslims are racialized as less human, less worthy and less able to enjoy free speech. So when their speech is suppressed, it doesn't matter. But they're also simultaneously constructed as an enemy who's coming to attack Western, see, white values. The free speech debate is on the front lines of projecting racialization, of maintaining the construction of whiteness and of maintaining the fundamental building blocks of liberalism. And this is why the right is so keen to talk about free speech. It's a prime discursive tool for their project. And it lets them be racist. It encourages them to be racist. They like being racist. Alright, who's up for drawing some things together with some, <laughs> some fucking concluding thoughts? Oh man, I'm tired. Back at the desk, you can't predict what I'm doing next. Don't try to predict what I'll do next. I'm at the desk now. Tomorrow I might be... I'll probably be still at this desk. I am rarely, rarely leave this desk these days. But you don't know that. This topic is, is so expansive, and there's so many topics that I wish I could have covered in here if I had unlimited time, uh, including the way that, that transphobes have started utilising free speech discourse to project their grim ideology, or how... Uh, free speech is, is inhibited by the social relations of the workplace or how UK, uh, the UK government has banned the use of, of work critical of capitalism and the use of critical race theory in school materials or how the UK government has banned drill music. There's just so many examples of the way free speech is being uh, inhibited by the dominant systems of racial capitalism. But what I really wanted to get across here is that we shouldn't get ourselves bogged down in like abstracted debates about absolute right to free speech versus censorship. These aren't the prime questions which are relevant for free speech right now, today. Instead, we should focus our critique on how free speech is a material condition with material impacts and material constraints. But capitalism creates hierarchies of speech and that social media platforms are able to create the rules without any social input at all. This is to say that to protect free speech, we can't just tinker around the edges. We actually have to overthrow the established hierarchies and build new systems free from the oppressions of racial capitalism. Finally, and I think in some ways most importantly, we should always be aware 
of what this current cultural debate about free speech is really for. It's not just that right-wingers are being idiots, though they are, and it's not just that they're big babies who are crying about never being invited to parties, though again, to be clear, they are. Rather, it's that the free speech debate is a prime method that liberalism has always used to construct a feared racial other and project the supremacy of liberal, western, European, white civilization. Engaging in the free speech debate without realising this risks you falling into those same deeply reactionary liberal assumptions. And if you do that, it means they've already won. Like I said at the beginning, I'm pretty bored of the free speech debate. But if we shift things and start to interrogate some of the things I've talked about in this video, well then, it might just start to get very, very exciting. Now, with all that being said, for being serious for a moment, if you could all please, if you've watched this video and enjoyed it, cancel me and attack my free speech so that this can go viral. Um, I would very much appreciate that. Um, hashtag cancel JTD. Get that going. Cheers. All right, we're done. Look at this idiot here on screen, thinking this was a good idea to do. Yeah, great, great, great one, John. Great one. All right. As ever, massive thanks to uh, all the people who helped make this video, uh, including the the Lickrit guy in participation on Twitch, Arjan from Leftover Pod, and Chloe from Crom Radio for all their frankly stunning and beautiful quote readings. Also, massive thanks to my patrons who helped me make this video and get through my PhD. Uh, particular thanks to Paul Singleton, Tamash Kispita, Seamus Morrison, Stephanie Beverly, Sinan Kos, J. Fraser Cartwright, Jam Tapot, Nelly Zacheva, Mercutio, uh, Cameron Blakeman, Daniel Hughes, Hey Joe, Luke Evans, Gary Dillon, Oluwateo Adewale, Some Dumbass, Callum, and... Lila, the worst and most pathetic small uwu bean. If you'd like to pay me money to make me read out a, a name that will make me squirm, then that's that's your prerogative, uh, and and you could you could do that. Just go to uh, Patreon.com/slash/JohnTheDuncan, or give a one-off donation using Kofi. Link in the description. All right, I think that's us. I think we're done. Alright. Cheers. See you next time. It really hurts. Ow. Don't put tape on your mouth. It fucking sucks. <laughs>